guys, the idea behind this is to get through some of the key points that the government has launched um, and to make sure that uh, a lot of the things that are going on at the moment um, are addressed with detail and with visibility on what might apply to you. And to do that, we have two guests. Uh, we have Dom and Ilan. Uh, they've been longtime friends. And uh, I, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. But maybe let's start off with Dom. If you haven't watched the, the recent video podcast I did with him, you can get some more insights about Kodak and who he is. But, um, but also, it's probably a good chance for you, Dom, to just reiterate some of those key points. Dom. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, thanks very much, Carlos. Um, so my name is Dom Hallis. I run the Coalition for a Digital Economy, or CODEC for short. I'm the executive director. Um, and we're really a lobby group for tech startups in the UK. So, um, you know, what does that mean in practice? It means lobbying on things like access to talent. So how do we improve immigration policy for startups or access to finance? How do we improve, you know, the VC environment or, or R&D tax credits or, you know, whatever. And then on the regulation side as well, how do we improve the regulatory environment for startups? But probably most pertinent for the discussion today and the, the broader support package that the government is providing, we've been lobbying really hard uh, and, and negotiating with the government on the package that they announced on Monday. Um, and we're sort of uh, have been part of the, the kind of cornerstone of that campaign and the Save Our Startups campaign, which resulted in the government announcing the package on Monday. So I'm happy to sort of explain a little bit more about in detail about what the package looks like, what we don't know, what we do know, uh, what we hope to know, what we hope to get, um, and you know, and, and a little bit hopefully where we have questions about specifics of, of what we think the government direction of travel is, even if we, we don't know exactly what they're thinking uh, is at the moment in, in sort of formal terms. Excellent. Thanks, Dom. Ilan, um, before I, you, you introduce yourself briefly, I just wanted to Again, thank you for joining us. Ilan's been a longtime supporter of Seed Camp, one of the earliest backers of Seed Camp when it started well a while back. And even though the name of the law firm that he's representing has changed since then, um, he's been a longstanding friend and supporter of Seed Camp. So, Ilan. Thank you, um, Carlos. Yes, I, uh, Ilan Steiner, I'm with a, a law firm, Auric. Uh, I worked with uh, Seed Camp on the establishment of the, the first Seed Camp fund uh, back in 2007. So, um, uh, it, it goes back a, a long way and, and, and um, I, I've worked with a lot of the portfolio companies uh, since then too. Uh, in terms of Oric and the law firm I'm with, we're a Californian headquartered, Californian heart and minded uh, law firm, uh, very much Silicon Valley based with our headquarters in San Francisco. Uh, and the idea is working with tech and innovative companies uh, and the investors who are working on with, uh, with them uh, and investing in them. Um, in, a, in a tech ecosystem. So, you know, whilst the, the largest clients of the firm are uh, companies like uh, Sybase and Oracle and Microsoft, actually what excites us most is the fact that we have around 28, 2900 tech companies that we're working with on an international basis. You know, some that are really early startups um, getting their first um, ASA from, from, from CCAP um, and, and some that have grown through the series funding rounds into becoming uh, large, uh, large companies themselves. So some of the, the poster children for that might be Revolut uh, in, in the UK, uh, Stripe in the US, Facebook, uh, all companies that we've worked with since they were very early startups. So um, great to be associated with um, uh, with Seacamp. In, in terms of uh, my role here today, um, I, I've been working with HM uh, Treasury on, on the uh, structuring of the scheme and the documentation, uh, the underlying documentation and heads of terms and what we think would be appropriate market terms for implementing this, kind of supplementing from the legal side what Dom and others have been doing from a from a market need and and, and uh, appropriate perspective uh, side. Um, it, it's great if you know it seems as if the uh, the, the terms um, have been so far well received by the market. There are some areas where um, it hasn't yet uh, achieved everything that it, it should do. Um, but my role here today is to try and look at the final terms with you and help demystify some of the questions that you might have uh, on what it has what, what is what has been announced great thanks thanks for that introduction line okay so for everyone who's on the on the stream and and um, this particular uh, call the the agenda just so you know is going to be we're going to go through an update of the current policies that are in place not just the the future fund but also all the other ones that that have been launched including the R&D so Dom you know I'll, I'll let you kick off there then we're going to go through what the qualifiers are. Um, you know, Dom and Elon, you can jump in with anything from uh, 
prerequisites to qualify for each one of those initiatives. Then we're going to jump into timings. I think a lot of people want to have a sense on when these things are going to be available, when they can expect effectively, when they can expect cash in the bank. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about legal considerations around each one of these, you know, whether there's a, uh, some structures that preclude them from being able to, to, to happen that you might find yourself in, whether it might be jurisdictional or whether it be like previous investments or um, tax structures. Uh, and then lastly, just to open it up for Q&A. So that's just a general agenda for, for this particular uh, call. And, and so to, to kick things off, Dom, maybe you can walk us through uh, in effect, catalog what the what the initiatives are to date that are relevant for startups. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I think the starting point for this conversation uh, has to be what existed before Monday, and then we can talk about how the, the package that was announced on Monday by the government impacted. So, the three main schemes for business in general that existed before the announcements on Monday and of the tech startup package were um, the CGR, the CJRS, the, the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme in which the government would pay up to 80% of, of salaries, up to two and a half thousand pounds a month for what they're calling furloughed workers. So people who essentially were put on furlough and weren't working for your company. Uh, the CBILS loan scheme, uh, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, which has been run by the BBB and you guys will have seen a lot about. Um, and the, the business rates relief scheme under which people who pay business rates and, you know, based on your premises, uh, uh, smaller companies will be able to access grants uh, uh, depending on that. I mean, and I think the most important thing and something that uh, Carlson and I spoke about a couple of weeks ago uh, when, when I went on the podcast is that uh, the main problem was that only one of those three was really applicable for, for the, the kind of people who, who we deal with on a daily basis, the kind of tech startups, because um, the CBIL scheme didn't really work because companies weren't able to access the loans. And the... Um, and the business rates reduction stuff, the business rate, business rate relief stuff didn't really work because uh, a lot of startups work in co-working spaces and don't actually theoretically, you know, even if they're paying business rates, they're paying it through some kind of membership structure and the government wasn't able to identify them and give them the grant. Money. So they could only really access the, the, the furlough scheme. So then um, we've been engaging with the government an awful lot with a bunch of other people on exactly what, uh, what we could do about that, what additional support could be provided. And on Monday, the government announced a package uh, that they're calling 1.25 billion in practice is about 800 million of new money um, for the startup ecosystem. And this is divided up into two parts. One is, is through a new tranche of funding for Innovate UK. So uh, a sort of, they're calling the top line figure is 750 million, but 200 million of that is for uh, expediting grant payments of additional grants and loans that Innovate UK has for additional, what they call customers in the most government speak of the world. Um, and then, uh, you know, an additional um, 550, sorry, 500 million uh, for um, specifically for a uh, new, new money to go to uh, either existing customer, you know, existing customers of Innovate UK who, who need additional capital or, or new customers of UK that need uh, additional capital. Um, so that's one side. And then the second side is this new future fund, uh, which is uh, 250 million pounds of government funding to be matched by 250 million pounds of private funding on a one-to-one -one match basis in which the government would invest in uh, convertible loan notes in startups uh, that have to have raised more than 250,000 pounds of external capital. And the matching can start at a minimum of 125,000 from the government and 125,000 from private, so 250 total, um, and go up to up to 5 million pounds of public capital to match 5 million pounds of private capital. So that's the, the very broad brush of the schemes. I'm sure we can talk an awful lot more about the specifics and, and Elan and I can both go into that in more, with more detail, but that's the gist of what's just been announced. Thanks for that, Dom. And you know, that, that's a lot, and we'll we'll cover some of those, and we'll be monitoring questions for people who want to talk about some of the ones that don't apply and why they don't apply, or the ones that we are looking at that that matter. And uh, Elan, you've been involved with all of these, or mostly just on the future fund that recently launched, just to qualify specifics on the future fund uh, and, and and underlying terms and documents relating to that. Oh, okay, great. So maybe we, we kick off with, with those. I mean, I think the furlough scheme is, is one that has been, for the most part, um, it has like a lot of content that's already gone out. Uh, so let, let's pause that one for a second. But if we, if we move on to these two new ones that have been launched, um, we can go into the details of them. 
with regards to the, maybe let's kick off on the qualifiers um, here for the future fund, uh, since those are the, the ones that you rattled off quickly there, Dom. Um, let's go through those in a little bit more detail. What, what, what's the, maybe Alon as well, if, what are the exact qualifiers here, uh, other than the amount of money raised, previous, previously having to raise, like what are the things that will qualify you or disqualify you from being able to be a participant in this? Yeah, Alan, so, I don't know whether you want to explain a little bit the, the terms of the loan notes and then I can I can explain the conversations behind behind that and what, what the government is thinking. Sure. Um, eligibility is very much um, designed to be as simple as possible. It's uh, designed to support UK companies. Um, and so, um, you know, having a, a presence in the UK, um, a substantial presence in the UK and also having a a UK company uh, involved in the case of a group company. The idea is, is that is a UK parent company. We'll come on to that uh, in one of your, your, your later questions. Um, effectively, there'll be some anti-fraud, anti-money laundering and other checks that will need to be go gone through uh, in order to qualify as part of the application process. Um, but the idea is to keep eligibility otherwise uh, fairly simple. So uh, established companies, they must have raised at least £250,000 uh, in the previous five years, so relatively fresh. Um, and the idea is they are eligible, eligible um, so long as they can bring new money, which will be matched to the government funding uh, at least um, at least 50%. What, what is the time lag on that? Because I, one of the questions that we're getting is, uh, just raise is just raised what like as of the moment this was announced on the Monday or is it like if they raised closed around last week that they could have extended that what, what is the time frame that's been yeah so so I just think you mean in terms of like would that count as a match is that the question you're asking yeah because uh, you know the, the specific question from one of the founders is like if you raised in April yeah yeah, yeah no of course yeah yeah no totally um so so the, the answer to that question is like that's still under discussion, uh, but obviously, I mean, a lot of it comes down to exactly how the, the and I think this is, the, this is gonna be the, the fundamental difference between the way in which Ilan and I discuss this over the, course of the, over the course of the next hour, is that Ilan as a lawyer is gonna say, well, it depends on how the legal terms are structured and what we see in the legal terms means X, Y, Z. And I'm gonna say, the legal terms are up for negotiation, it's all about policy. <laughs> but like, but the, the, the fundamental comes down to like, uh, you know, that's still a conversation that we're having with the government and a bunch of partners are having with the government but ultimately like as it's currently structured like that would be difficult um but the reality of the way in which the government wants to then proceed from where they've got to thus far on the scheme with still an awful lot of detail to clarify from you know from the kind of distribution mechanism to the full eligibility criteria to you know wherever like there's still a lot of information to come in, and that's still a policy debate that's ongoing yeah, and just 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 to add to what Dominic uh, said, as a lawyer who does more than just uh, read a document and say what the document says, you know, clearly the policy is a desire to support uh, companies that wouldn't otherwise be funded. Uh, and so, you know, in, in, in some of that policy discussion, if companies are being independently funded by by their investors, then, um, you know, it's difficult or that, that's not, you know, money that the government is wanting to target. Uh, at the same time, in order to implement a system like this at scale, it will be very difficult to match existing funding rounds that have gone in on different terms. And so a strong desire to steer everyone into the same form convertible note, to have the identity of interest between the matched funding investors and the government in that loan note is a really important feature. So, you know, to the extent that you've already closed a funding round, um, I think it would be very difficult for the system to go back and, and look at that and try and credit it um, uh, for, for, for those policy reasons. Um, if you are in the middle of a funding round um, or about to enter into one, um, I, you know, I guess if you can wait and, and if, if the scheme is of interest to you and you can wait, then it's certainly worth waiting um, to see when the scheme um, details are announced uh, and for your matched investors to come in on the same terms. Um, so if you're able to do that, um, uh, either, uh, either by absolutely waiting uh, or by putting interim structures in which allow you to get there, uh, without that funding coming in, that might be another option. Mm. I mean, look, we're, we're kind of jumping in a little bit into some of the legal considerations, so might as well do that for the specific thing. Love that mug, by the way, Elon. It's a cool mug. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, if you look unfortunately, at, unfortunately, it's empty, so I don't know if, if, if you uh, or someone else could refill it for me, but uh, <laughs> shout out to my people. <laughs> um, but when we look at some of the points that, you know, timing was one, um, structure is another. I think some people have had questions regarding whether the the round itself has to be also a, a convertible loan node. 
like just some of the other legal uh, implications of having this as a parallel instrument. Um, how does it how does it work if you need to have um, uh, the the main investment perhaps be priced differently in order to accommodate the convertible loan note, um, which may not necessarily be if, if the first investment isn't in a CLN, then how do you replicate that? So just trying to get some sense for guidance that that you're would be giving somebody right now in terms of constructing around or adapting around so that it could qualify for this. Um, I, I would strongly um, recommend that not putting in place a round that you hope might qualify or finalizing that round until full eligibility criteria are published. Um, you know, the, 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 the government is legislating quickly. It's responding to industry requests and demands um, by announcing something before it's fully based. Um, governments never like doing that, um, but you know we, we're in pretty uncharted territory, and um, the the speed with which they have sought to respond uh, and give some comfort to the market uh, is impressive. There'll be some lag time in getting some of the institutions behind, so that you know when applications open, it can be as smooth as possible in order for money to come through. No one wants to have an application process that then takes weeks to to apply. So that application process and the infrastructure behind it. Uh, still needs to be built, uh, is in the process of being built. Um, and when it is built, it can answer some of these questions. Um, just to touch on the point you just made there, like the distribution mechanism, the application mechanism. I mean, is this, how, what is it? Is it going to be like th there is a submission process or is it that the investor submits on your behalf or how does, how does that? Yeah, I can, how talk, is that going to be? I can talk a yeah. little bit about that. Um, like, uh, I mean, I think, I think it, so I get, well, I can tell you what, what we think the process should be. And I can talk a little bit about where the discussion is and I can talk a little bit about what the government is building. Um, but basically like there's a, you know, ultimately like there's going to have to be a front end in which, uh, a fairly simple process where, you know, it, there is an input from, from ideally from a company, although there is still the discussion as to whether it would be from the fund. I mean, our strong preference would it be that it was a company driven process. Um, uh, in order to to achieve matching funding on the basis of you know submitting to a certain criteria that would be clear and transparent, um, and then the idea is once you meet that clear and transparent criteria, the basis and the principle of behind having you know the the matching funding is that the assumption is that uh, there's a sort of longer term due diligence. Uh, that would be typical in, in venture investment wouldn't necessarily be required in this case precisely because we want to get the money out of the door as soon as possible. So that's the conversations we're having with the government. I mean, I think like there's sort of two discussions there and, and it's based, based entirely on a conversation that I had about four hours ago with number 10 um, is that uh, I think there's sort of two things to, to kind of flag. Like one is that we're hopeful that there will be um, kind of two ways to do this from a company perspective. One will be that um, a, a fairly traditional, you come with your matching investor, you say, here's my matching investor, here's my filling in of this form with the criteria, rubber stamp, great, you get your money as soon as, as, soon as it's dealt with. And then there's a sort of alternative structure, which is something that looks a lot more like the advanced assurance in the IS system, which is saying, here are, you know, I'm going to fill in the part on the criteria, but I'm not going to fill in the part on the investor. And the idea that you can get a sort of um, rubber stamp that you are kind of future fund eligible, if that makes sense, before going away and seeking private investment. But that's still very much a policy conversation that's ongoing, but we're hopeful that that's a direction of travel. Tom, I mean, we're jumping around a little bit on the agenda, but it's probably worth doing just to keep things flowing. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about later was timings. And it sounds like some of these processes that you're just outlining at the moment uh, could drag. And I'm just curious as to what what the goal is there in terms of getting somebody over the line. And is is it going to be enough of a lag that there, people are going to have to structure second closings for their rounds in order to enable this to get approved? Because the HMRC pre-approval for SES and EIS can sometimes, you know, take yeah, time, so, so, but so it's the, a pre-approval. So, so the um, so the reason. So, I'll just explain the rationale behind the pre-approval, and I'll talk about that. The reason why the pre-approval we think is important is not so much for, frankly, for for many of the people you guys would deal with, but is actually, uh, and oftentimes people who would then be perhaps seeking uh, investment from people like angels, where it would be easier to to get clarification if they could guarantee that they could get the government match funding as opposed to beforehand. But I think in terms of the the kind of lag, the implication and the uh, impression that I've got from government and based on all of our conversations and based on the idea of having a quite clear and simple deterministic criteria on the assumption that mon you know the, the aim of the game is to be getting the money out of the door as soon as possible it should be a very fluid process now like 
let's wait and see because obviously it's easy to say that in my position and then it's easy to say that uh, before you know before you see the building but ultimately like we're quite confident that a fairly simple process can be put in place you know i think the complexity comes in depending on exactly what um you know if if for example and and ilan can talk about this a little bit but actually it depends on exactly the the terms on which the investing matching investor is coming in so for example like it's very easy if the matching investor comes in on exactly the same terms as the convertible loan note as structured but even within the terms of the note it, it you know that's the sort of for example like the interest rate that's a minimum floor but if the if the matching investor actually wanted more then the terms of the government would have to change as well and so then it becomes more complicated and requires more back-end work but actually like if you know uh, in theory, if, if an investor came in on the same terms as the government loan note, as exactly as it ends up being structured, or whatever government note ends up being structured, then it should be a fairly simple process. Hmm. Well, I, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Elan, but we have questions coming in from the audience, so uh, I, can, I can always jump to those. Jump to the questions. Uh, great. Dump, dump summarize as well. Great. Well, I think that there's a lot of qualifier questions. I, I appreciate there's a lot of things that are um, still unknown or in process, but it, it seems like one of the one of the issues is around w what are the restrictions on the private investors for it to be a qualifying investor? You know, will it be a UK based investors only that will be matched by the government, or is it any investor? Just may maybe some visibility on 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 what triggers that. So at the moment, there are no qualifications on who the investor might be. And I think it's intended that that would be, would be the case and continue to be the case. Um, you know, clearly there are some elements which the government needs to uh, look at and ensure that, you know, there aren't bad actors or, 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 or sanctions uh, countries uh, or people involved. But, but other than that, the strong desire is to have very little qualification on, on who the investor might be. Great. Um, another question was with regards to the uh, size of the pot. Um, it, it seems like for some, if you do the math of the number of companies that equates to, it's like somewhere in the low thousands. And curious as to whether the this is just um, an interim or it's like uh, a test, and then before there's more or any visibility there. Yeah. So, so um, you know, based on our conversations with the government, I mean, I think I think that this has to be seen in the context of the the broader sea bill scheme, where the government announced a huge amount of money but hasn't managed to get money out of the door. And I think actually, like. You know, in, in our minds and, and based on the conversations that we're having, we're quite confident that if the scheme is a success and that we're seeing traction, then there'll be there'll be a willingness to consider more more capital. But a lot of that comes down to exactly how the scheme is structured, you know, whether it works for the companies involved, whether we're getting a good diversity of companies getting through. And I think one of the concerns, understandably, is is around like it's, you know, are we just going to see a bunch of, you know, for example, if you just did, you could do 50, 55 million pound matches and that would be, that would be done. Right. But obviously that's not the intention. So it's like, how do we make sure that the structure is right to ensure that a broad range of a diverse range of companies can, can get the capital. And then hopefully we're confident that once we see that, and once we see it's success, it, it is successful, then we'll, we'll be able to make further progress. Yeah. Um, maybe one for you, Alon. I, I think there's a lot of questions popping up about how this interplays with EIS and SES qualification and co-investment and structure of the round for the main investor. What, what's the what's the view there? So th that's something that's still being looked at in the detail. Um, the round as structured is probably not a round that qualifies for SEIS. Um, I think it's expected and that it shouldn't necessarily negatively impact any existing EIS. Uh, or VCT investors in a company, um, it, you know, an, an, an EIS investor might still be willing to support uh, or VCT investor the uh, the round in the convertible note form. In the case of VCTs, it certainly has a capacity to have, you know, some of its uh, investments in in qualifying holdings which aren't uh, shares themselves. So uh, depending on VCT's uh, um, personal circumstances, they could still participate in this without it being a disqualifying event. Uh, and the EIS investors could participate without it necessarily um, uh, getting the benefits of, of EIS when they participate. Uh, there is some, some discussion as to how on conversion, the underlying shares that it converts into might also be eligible shares for the benefit. Uh, and that will very much be in the detail. Yeah, talking about conversions, a good transition to uh, the, the payment and repayment and conversion debate. I think that that's been a debate that's come up in a couple of forums. It's the the idea that perhaps um, this is going to be a forced conversion 
uh, event in, in the future round, uh, whether or not there's a provision for repayment. And if the provision for repayment exists, like a traditional CLN, what, what that would look like. Um, yeah, I mean, I can I can talk a little bit about that, and then Ellen can talk more. I mean, I think the general I, Ellen can probably explain the specifics, but I, but I think the 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 general thing I would comment on is like that the the government has intentionally structured that with this with the intention of of getting the converts right. So like it has heavily disincentivized people from repaying, and that's a, there's a reason for that. It's because like the the government is protecting protecting the position, which is a very sensible thing to do and an entirely legitimate thing to do. And I'm sure Ellen can explain a little bit about exactly how that's structured. Yeah, just to supplement that, this very much is an equity instrument rather than a debt instrument. So, you know, separate to to, to C bills and approaching this in a very different way. Um, you know, there might be methods for voluntary prepayment by the company, but if it did that, it would just result in you know adverse selection. Any of the decent companies would buy themselves out of the loan at an early stage, and the government wouldn't get the equity return uh, that it might otherwise get. So, you know, the mechanism is for a conversion. It's for a conversion of a future equity round automatically if that is a qualifying round, uh, details to be confirmed, but effectively just any financing round um, of at least the same value as, as, as this loan note. Um, and you know, on a non-qualifying round, which is another financing round, conversion can happen at the option of the holders uh, of, of at least half of the matched investors holding. So it's not a government decision, um, and the government you know, throughout the note will try and take uh, as little governance, we can come on to that point uh, again later, um, uh, as, as it can. Um, but conversion is certainly the ultimate goal. Um, for that reason, the maturity date has been set at a maximum of three years. Um, that's off market long, uh, but intentionally so, uh, because the strong desire is that companies are given a period um, to work through current environment and uncertainties and uh, a long time to implement a funding round or an exit. Uh, and it's hoped that within the three year period, um, a vast majority of, you know, hopefully all of the companies will have had some kind of external priced equity round, which allow conversion or would have had an exit, which would uh, uh, allow that too. Um, if not, at the end of the three year period, um, the intention is to convert at the last round price and an undiscounted uh, version of the last round price. Um, and that will be whatever is the most recent funding round that has happened. Um, uh, and uh, at the option of various parties, it might be repaid, but at a two times um, the principal amount. So a 100% redemption premium. Yeah, no, that makes sense. But you brought up a good point when you were talking through some of those details. And being that some of these investments can be anywhere between, you know, 125 to 5 million, you know, 5 million on, on a part on a partnering with another fund, you end up with a perhaps a governance implication. What is the, the view and who is going to be running that uh, from the future fund perspective? Um, is there going to be more passive governance? What, what's the what's the general trend at the moment? So the government doesn't have any infrastructure uh, in place at the moment um, uh, and, you know, it's debating whether it has any desire to put in place uh, infrastructure to actively manage a portfolio of investments. Uh, I think very strongly they don't want to actively manage. Uh, and so, you know, in designing the instrument, there is a strong intent uh, to give the government as little um, uh, influence uh, and control, responsibility, positive control uh, as possible. Some of the, the main decisions are taken uh, by the holders of the majority of the matched investors. Um, you know, for that reason, the match is a very important part. The having match terms is a very important part because um, it significantly influences um, the, the behavior of the parties in the instrument. They, they, they are, you know, they have a, a uniform ident uh, approach to it and, and, and interest. Um, mm -hmm. So um, that's very much the case. Um, the anticipated holdings of the government in most of these companies will be very small. Uh, and the government is not, as a result, looking for any uh, significant uh, governance at all. Great. No, that, that's helpful. And I guess in, in, the, in the same spirit of governance, I mean, there's an element of uh, funds, all funds, as, as you know, Elon, have restrictions on investment. Um, and curious as to whether or not there's going to be a similar uh, type of umbrella for this kind of fund where certain sectors may not be eligible. I mean, I'll throw some out there, you know, Bitcoin or, or CBD products or whatever. Is, is there going to be any restrictions on sectors um, that qualify or do not qualify for this, even if they have all the other qualifiers? 
That will certainly need to be worked through. Um, you know, the, the, the headline talks about um, subject to customer fraud, money laundering, KYC checks. I think there is no desire to steer this into a particular industry or specifically exclude any particular industry. Um, clearly, some some understanding of you know not involved in in, in illegal acts uh, by any company uh, will need to be. But but the government again doesn't have the infrastructure in place and doesn't have a, a strong desire to do any underlying DD on the companies it's uh, making its participate in its investment in. Mm. You know, cl clearly, it could achieve that by um, you know having a degree of you know, due diligence on accredited investors and restricting the the path there. Um, but that has some negative policy decisions, which it doesn't want to go down that route. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good to know. So it, it sounds like it's, it's very inclusive. On on that point, how long is this going to be available for? Uh, it says that the current uh, headline terms are initially until September 2020. Um, is there any visibility on this will be extended? Yeah, so so I mean, I think the the big thing here is it's sort of how long is a piece of string because it depends a little bit on the broader government economic response and the broader you know circumstances as to what well, can i leave my spare bedroom before september that's the that's the question isn't it like but i but I, so i think there's a there's a little bit of a um it will be a a, a sort of um a movable feast to a certain extent as and when you know uh, depending on uptake and then also depending on you know how, what the crisis looks like what the funding market looks like but but i think that they'll be sort of open to conversation about about how it's structured going forward i mean i think that the important thing to point out is that you know in the case of certainly this initial tranche of 250 50 million pounds um to be blunt about it like the government wants to get that money out of the door Right, so so I'd be very very surprised. You know, it says the fund is going to be open to September, but but the point is that actually, like the, the fund will be deploying capital as soon as they possibly can, and will hopefully have deployed a lot of that capital way before September. And so I think like there's a, you know, the, the question is more like about what you know what would happen at that point if if the circumstances more broadly in the economy reflect the need for for additional action. Mm, that's a good point. Well, I mean, you know, it seems like this is a, a win for many people. Uh, it, it's going to help quite a bit. And I guess one of the questions that we've, we've received is from a startup perspective, this seems like a no brainer. I mean, um, why would you not take advantage of this or why would you not try to, even if you didn't really need it? Yeah. So, 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 I mean, I think, so, so it's funny, like this is, I've done, I've done, I think this is probably my like sixth webinar on, on this so far as an, uh, and this this one is, I mean, maybe it's because you're in the chair, Carlos, and you're just very civilized. But this one's much more polite than the other ones where I got shouted at extensively for <laughs> for, a solid, for a solid. And I mean, I think that the look like the point is like that. Some what strikes me is like what you can just you can debate the sort of. I think there are if you are an eligible startup. So the first the first point is there's a challenge around eligibility and the two fifty the 250 sort of minimum raise is a fundamental problem for a bunch of businesses in the ecosystem. We know that, right? Then, but once you once you sort of fall into that broad eligibility bucket, like it seems to, to us at least that the terms are uh, within the context of the current funding environment, uh, pretty reasonable. Uh, and, and absolutely, I mean, we would be, you know, we wouldn't have sort of landed where we landed if, if we didn't think that uh, they were broadly the, the sort of support that startups would be, would be interested in. Mm. Yeah, just, just just to add just to add to that, the the terms of this funding round, I'm going to say, are priced. Um, they're 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 a little expensive. Um, in the context of the current uh, crisis, um, they're certainly not uh, overly expensive. But if you are able to get independent funding from your investors uh, at a cheaper price, or you're happy to do a price round now because you, you're happy with the valuation. Um, then you know that's not who this is targeted at, and those companies may be very willing uh, to carry on taking funding from existing and new investors on terms that they're comfortable with. Um, but you know, the, if not, uh, and if the support of you know a match funding from the government is is useful to you, um, then these are designed to be commercially appropriate with the flex, without being you know a perverse in in, in its in its expensiveness uh, from a government perspective. But building in the flexibility of allowing a higher interest rates, a larger discount, uh, and also putting a valuation cap, which will be open to investors to do if they wanted to, in providing their match funding, that flexibility will be provided. Uh, I think in that sense, it's been it's been pitched quite se uh, sensibly. Yeah. Well, I mean, for companies that are that are considering this, I mean, another another thing that might manifest itself later down the road, and Elan, you've done enough of these to to maybe have a view is. How do you think that this is going to affect um, 
the investors ownership requirements down the road and it, do you think that this will be like a um kind of a landmine that that later will will make itself known in the cap table in a way that is unexpected for founders is there anything that they should be thinking about or considering or is this pretty much uh innocuous uh we hope not um you know the scheme is designed both to be fairly attractive if not a little expensive right now um but also designed in order for it to be useful in the company and not a restriction on its ability to fundraise and operate in the future you know that's a really important feature you don't want to solve a current problem only to have one 80 months down the road when people go to their financing so so the terms are designed as far as possible um to be fair uh, and, and and work for future uh, operations um you know unknown unknowns um they may well be there mm. now one of the things that that clearly is is um going to be required as part of this is a, a submission of an application is there anything that you guys recommend materials wise that would be helpful for them to start preparing and getting uh ready for uh, an application that would you know whether it be minutes or anything like that stuff that maybe isn't so intuitive that would help uh, expedite or approve that the the process yeah so so we're hoping i mean i think that the big thing for us at the moment is we're pushing on the bbb to to publish a, a sort of clearer um as early as possible exactly what they're envisaging those those outlines look like we you know we in, in the process of of making our recommendations the government did quite a lot of of work on what exactly those kind of criteria and what what documentation and what you know what supporting documents would be required uh, on behalf of startups in the first place so we have a sort of broad idea but but i think the main point is like we need to be as transparent as we can about what that looks like as soon as possible before the process opens because we know that it's going to be a bit of a a bit of a first come first serve basis once you, once that door opens so i mean i think the, the biggest thing actually is just having conversations with you know existing or potential investors about the, the you know the broader scheme like what that means for them whether they're thinking about it what you know what where are their heads are um because that's that's ultimately going to be a key part of the conversation mm. um on uh, jumping a little bit back backwards uh to conversion events elon i was thinking about you know the traditional way of conversion uh inheriting a lot of the rights of the future round is there any provisions that are going to be written in explicitly into the CLN that from the government that will in effect neutralize some of those assumptions like for example pro rata rights you know upon conversion is is the government now uh, or or if if they're not taking up pro rata after conversion it's like who who does it get assigned to and all these little nuances that might skew people's views on it so the government is not intending to be prescriptive on any of those points um and if the priority rights aren't taken up then whatever the governing documents say uh, around who those rights would go to whether it's uh, other investors or whether it's third parties uh, would apply so the government will fit into the agreed documentation of any future funding round it, it won't be prescriptive on those points um it, 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 it it's reserving the right to take some of the governance rights because one of the potential uh, outcomes or scenarios for this is you know in time you know uh, a potential exit might be a sell to a secondary uh, investor so packaging of the portfolio uh, into a bundle of assets and selling them on to a uh, a future uh, secondary investor who may well um uh, manage that a little bit more actively uh, might want information rights for example uh, and so you know the right for the government to request those or or, or the shares held uh, by by those government shares to to request that is something that's built into the future documentation but secondary shouldn't be something that uh that companies are are concerned by um you know we 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 know they can have a positive effect for some of the uh investors who are selling their portfolios in the same way as uh, a sell by the government might be a part of positive i should just say like i think um because i know there's been a couple of questions on it as well but i can talk a little bit about the the sort of still still pushing policy discussions but one but one of them is exactly that conversation around transfer rights basically which is just like you know ultimately under the structure that is currently currently uh, uh, in draft form like the idea is that ultimately the government could could transfer you want you know could sell sell your um your stake to a, another investor without basically um much much say on behalf of the companies and like understanding how we can effectively uh you know create some kind of barrier to that or at least a, you know a, a sort of more sympathetic process that is really important i mean i think just a couple of points because again I, i've sort of seen a couple of questions on it more broadly on things like eas as elan said like you know this is still very much an open policy conversation it is difficult to do it's not very simple to make these eas compliant for various structural reasons but like the 
from a codec perspective and more broadly from the people who are engaging the government on this perspective like we're really really clear that like that's a hugely important uh, area to be working on because we know that um we know that that's a, a crucial part particularly of, of uh making sure that this this scheme is sort of accessible as possible and that a wide range of investors uh, many of whom use uh, eis compliant products for their investments are able to to leverage the scheme as they as they invest like that is still an ongoing discussion but that's one that we were aware that is uh that we sort of need to win um i mean i think uh there's sort of a still an ongoing like lengthy one, one of the fascinating challenges i think you'll explained it very well is like ultimately what what was announced on monday uh was probably finalized about six to twelve hours before and i only know that because i was on the phone with the treasury six to twelve hours before but like you know ultimately the ability to to then like look at this process going forward both in terms of the delivery mechanisms and the structures from the bbb end as to how you know what does the front end look like what does the user experience as a as a startup access and this funding look like but also this sort of eligibility criteria the policy structure all this kind of stuff is there are still a bunch of open questions so you know we're viewing this very much as the the broad framework and we think that's you know a, a sort of broad framework that we're pretty pleased with but there's still a, a bunch of discussions that are still still being had and, and hopefully will result in positive outcomes fair, fair enough and, and Dom, first of all, um, you know, we haven't thanked you enough and Ilan as well for a lot of the hard work that you've been doing behind the scenes and in, in getting this over the line and getting this launched. And I think it's, you know, it goes without saying that on behalf of everyone who's participating that we much appreciate both of your efforts and in, in getting a lot of the stuff over the line. And, and I don't know if you wanted to also name check Dom, anybody else from number 10 or 11 who's direct charge of this, who, who also benefits from some credit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, like, first of all, I, I'm always wary of naming civil servants as as because they, they suddenly have like miraculously full inboxes of poor people who are emailing them. But you know, I mean, I, I think it, the point is like, this has been a kind of a, a whole government effort on structure. And it's not easy for government to design something this bespoke this quickly. And that's precisely why, as Alan said, there's, there's still a bunch of questions, and that's probably appropriate. Um, I mean, I think just more broadly, in terms of the, the, the kind of people who've been working on this outside of government, you know, it's been a whole community effort. And you can a lot of the people on the call have seen the um, the kind of wide range of stakeholders that have been engaging in with the government as to what exactly that package of support can look like and, and how you know we'll continue to engage with them to make sure that we get the kind of outcomes that everybody's asking for. And, and just just add to that, certainly within the you know within the core group who who are fronting this and and and, and linked into the chancellor, um, it, it's a pretty fast paced, fast moving, very active, very responsive, yeah. deeply impressive set of people. Um, who who really do get it uh, and really are uh, promoting this very well. You know, listening to a lot of the, the the lobbyists and groups coming in, like Dom and others, who are making the case for the industry in, in different ways, seeking to get the appropriate balance uh, of discussions uh, and then trying to implement it. You know, in part and after some of those discussions are had, being dragged down by some of the policy and 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 legal and PR and other issues, which you know inevitably come from 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 the government and and, and its involvement. Uh, but at the core, it's a it's a fast paced, fast moving. Um, pretty impressive team. Well, thanks again for that, guys. And um, on, I know we covered quite a bit of the future fund, and I, I, I didn't want to finish without going into more details to some of the other pools of, mm. of capital that you mentioned, the, the Innovate UK, R&D. Do you want to touch upon some of the points there that might have amended from anybody who's not familiar with that, like whether it be the qualifiers, whether it be the quantums, the process, anything that's changed there other than the size available? Yeah, no, sure. So, so, I mean, I think the honest answer is that um, of the, you know, of the new capital that's being, that's being given to, to Innovate UK, which is about, about 550 million pounds, um, the honest answer is that the, the structure and the way in which this is being delivered is not clear yet. Like, so um, we've had a lot of conversations with Innovate and I'm sure that there's a lot of discussion going on behind closed doors about exactly what that structure looks like. We've, you know, put in our suggestions and have been engaging with them. But at, like, like with the, the Future Fund, I think there's still a lot more detail to come. Um, but I think the point is that, you know, what we've heard so far is that there's 550 million pounds there for loans and grants. And at the end of the day, as, as innovative startups that are doing exciting things in research and development, like you should absolutely be, be sort of engaging if, if you're already working st on stuff that's Innovate funded uh, with them right now as to whether or not you can speed up funding or potentially get additional funding. And if you aren't, um, then, you know, go and have those conversations, understand a little bit about how their existing programs are structured, because it's most likely that, uh, you know, a lot of the same sort of fundamental frameworks will be used. There's no point in reinventing the wheel when we're trying to 
distribute that volume of capital so quickly um, and so like that's you know the fundamental structures of these organizations will be the ones they attempt to use again as they try and push out this extra money to support the ecosystem through the crisis Alan? nothing nothing to add to that i mean look the, the, it sounds to me like there's quite a bit of, of work in progress still and actually one of the one of the questions was we really love you guys. Could we do another webinar with some of these questions once they've been clarified? Um, it, it's clear that so much good work has done uh, and has been done to date and, and you know, kudos to you guys and the lack of sleep that you guys are getting and getting this over the line. Um, but it, what would be the right interval uh, if we were to do something like this again, what would be the right interval or for other people to check for the fidelity of some of these initiatives to start taking shape? Is it a daily thing or is it like end of month? When, when do you reckon some of these points that we brought up, um, EIS, conversion, all these, you know, things, uh, we'll, we'll get more clarity. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the best place to start is uh, at the press conference on Monday, uh, the Chancellor said May. Now, May's, May's a long month, so it could be the start of May or the end of May, and, you know, from our perspective, and I think, uh, you know, it, the sooner the better. I, I do think, like, the important thing to bear in mind from a startup perspective is, you know, we would rather it take a week longer and get the scheme right than, than take a, you know, get it out of the door a week before and it'd be half-baked. And I think that's the thing that, um, you know, when we look at, uh, there's an interesting sort of challenge there, which is like that, that and Carlos and I had discussed this before, there's sort of equivalent startup packages elsewhere in Europe um, that are providing support for their ecosystems and were announced to much fanfare uh, a lot earlier than the British one. But actually, you know, uh, based on my conversations with different ecosystems, I yet to deliver any checks. And at the end of the day, you know, um, we, we were sort of all very happy that, that something came out on Monday. But until the check's clear, like it doesn't, you know, that sort of founder, like what difference does it make? And so I think like the really important thing is actually it's the time from, you know, from, for them is, is, is when they're able to actually access the cash. And so let's make sure we get the structure right so that they're able to do that really, really well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've looked at some of the other open questions, Carlos. There was there was one um, recommending a, a, a critique uh, of the uh, scheme on C legals, which I thought I'd mention. Um, uh, it's certainly critical. Um, you know that that's pretty clear. Um, uh, you know it, it's not always wrong, but it's also not always right in in how it's summarised the terms as they've been announced. Uh, and I think some of the approaches that it take. Um, probably, probably are, are more critical than it needs to be. You know, there are some areas that would be useful for it to be addressed, um, but but certainly, um, it's not as opposed to. You know, I'd suggest that seed legals would have no place in the financing of um, uh, in the financings that happen through the scheme, um, and um, you know that that would be a shame. I, I I wonder if that's part of the approach that's been taken. I, I was going to, I was going to say like just quickly actually, cause I think it's really helpful uh, context. Cause I was going to, I was going to mention that as well. So I'm glad that you did. Um, but like, I think there's sort of look like, like I said, I've been doing uh, these webinars for the whole of today. Most of yesterday we will continue to do so. And I think like we, we as kind of advocates for the community, it's really, really important that we're uh, as clear and transparent about what we're doing and how we're trying to engage and what the policy challenges are. Um, and I think like uh, there's a bunch of legitimate critiques of, of the scheme and you know that's perfectly appropriate people have different opinions I mean I think like broadly speaking they they fall into what, what I would kind of characterize as, as, as three buckets one is the schemes too small um, which uh, as we discussed like I think that we're um, you know we're not 100% certain but we're fairly confident that if we see that the scheme has traction and that it works that the government will look to, to provide additional capital and that's the conversations that we're having already but ultimately we have to get the structure right to do that the other is um, that the you know that the um, that the terms of the scheme are too onerous and, and that is where I have uh, less sympathy to be totally frank um, where I think the bet you know if, 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 as, as Ilan's rightly said, like ultimately people are able to raise private finance, financing successfully anyway, then, then this shouldn't be appropriate for them and they're entirely legitimately would go and raise the private financing they're able to do so. The point is this is supposed to be bridging capital in order to provide people a, a bridge over this crisis uh, in a, you know, and, and sort of top up the market in a way that we're, we're not able to do through the private capital at the moment because people are sitting on their hands or they don't have dry powder available. And then the third thing is, is, is around eligibility and the fact that a bunch of startups at the bottom end aren't able to access the scheme and like we'll be totally blunt from a codec perspective and say we were asking for the number to be lower like as in like we didn't you know like ultimately this is a policy discussion and it's entirely like i think that in and you know in startup world one of the things that 
Carlos and I were talking the other week on the podcast about how startup world can be a little bit of a bubble. And one of the amazing things uh, is like entirely reasonably, because if you're a founder that's raised under 250,000 pounds of private capital, you're very upset that the scheme doesn't work for you. And I totally understand that I'm really sympathetic and it's, it's a fairly awful position to be in when the government support being provided isn't necessarily a a able to be accessed by you. And that's what we've seen elsewhere you know, for other startups so far. But I'd also say like, you know, these are policy trade-offs the government has made and not necessarily policy decisions by people in the ecosystem. Um, and so like, there's a, there's a fascinating challenge of my, my reminder of that sort of outside world puncturing the bubble is that the, the Times opinion page yesterday after the scheme was announced to, to much fanfare and, and you know, people were, were saying, this is the priorities for the ecosystem. The Times op-ed page said, this is a disgrace this money shouldn't go to startups, we should put it in the NHS. And I think like that's the political context, like is that actually there's a broad range of different priorities for the government. And so like whilst it's not perfect, we're pretty pleased that, you know, we didn't want the, the sort of uh, the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And we're hopeful that as many companies as possible can benefit from what we have. Yeah, well said, Dom. Well, look, I, I'll do this. I'm, I'm gonna stop uh, the recording live stream and um, we can just debrief and, and chat about maybe how we can best uh, maybe set up a, another one for when a lot of this stuff is more clear. So I'm just going to temporarily stop that and thank uh, the audience, um, the people who are on the the Seed Camp group. Feel free to stay on uh, so while we wrap up. But uh, just wanted to thank those that uh, logged on via the stream and on YouTube. Thanks so much for joining. Hopefully you found this helpful and hopefully see you at the next one.